if I'm going to, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, both to participate with a group of students that we brought here from the Center for Research Architecture and other participants. Wonderful to see old friends and also see former students, et cetera, et cetera, and to have the opportunity to follow along over the course of the two super intense days of the symposium. So um, these are not by any means final thoughts, <laughs> on the contrary. They're at best uh, partial observations and um, maybe a set of reflections and what I've tried to do as I've been listening, thinking about all the, the you know, extremely diverse range of presentations and also the diversity of practitioners, I've basically tried to identify a few, uh, sort of thematic threads and clusters and perhaps um, yeah, also something, uh, what I'd characterize as a certain set of tendencies. Um, so we started the day yesterday and I did a very short introduction where I was trying to really grapple with the, the demand for knowledge production that has arrived within the academy vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, research-based creative kind of practices that need to reconfigure themselves as co constitutive of knowledge production. And one of the things that I was suggesting that you know, domains of practice like art, music, et cetera, design, et cetera, et cetera, that these kinds of practices and actions, though we might understand them as coming back to the, us as knowledge at certain times, that they also come back to us as other things, as provocations, as propositions, as anger, as demands, political demands, as experiential encounters, as perceptual events. and. That has really also been my observation over the course of the two days, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the kinds of um, yeah the kinds of practices that uh, you here are you we are all engaged in, and um, I think it's really important to um, bear that in mind. And also the other point that I made, which was a comment um, made a long time ago to me by who's someone who's now my colleague at the time she was one of the the staff and in, in visual cultures at Goldsmiths that was Irit Rogoff who was saying that research always uh, performs itself retroactively as practice so that uh, the research dimensions of the activities that are in, we're engaged with aren't de facto um, research practices but with a certain amount of um, critical self-reflection, et cetera, et cetera, analysis, we can understand oftentimes, much later, what was actually the kind of research dimension of the work that we do. Um, so I think both of those things have been expressed over the course of the two days. I also really liked a couple of comments made by um, the group Patton who talked about productive friction and also this concept or term cultivated instability. And I also thought that both of those are extremely provocative concepts that can in some way characterize, I think, many of the projects. Um, in terms of, let's say, uh, points of connection or contact zones between things that I saw. Um, maybe I'll sketch some of these out. They're not in any kind of like, there's not a specific kind of order, but um, one of the things that I thought was really important was how is it that we learn to work together? And um, that in particular I saw happening across different presentations, for example, the, um, the students who are actually in, in, involved in the philosophy program at the National School of Media Studies, I believe it is, trying to work through a set, th a set of theoretical and philosophical kind of concepts together. Um, certainly, the students that presented from our center, the MA students who presented their investigation, um, which which was, which was looking at human rights violations in off the coast of Australia. Um, asylum seekers who were being either turned back who, in, and, or turned back as in set adrift in very kind of uh, dubious 
uh, lifeboat scenarios, et cetera, also might find themselves in detention centers. So those MA st students who work together to produce an investigation that is now in the hands of a, a set of international lawyers working at Global Legal Action Network, and their investigation was called Unless the Water is Safer Than the Land. And I think they did a great job. Um, working together, trying to think together, despite the fact that uh, in working together, it, that doesn't mean that there's a kind of um, shared subjectivity on the kind of contrary. And um, something that has always been, or that I think is very important to, um, to stress is that when we attempt to work together, it's, we also have to be, I think, committed to a politics of incommensurability that to see how is it that we actually uh, recognize our kind of radical difference from each other and actually um, not attempt to produce a sort of artificial kind of framework in which everything is uh, rendered to and has a certain status of equivalence. And that would be very much what I would see as the sort of, that is the kind of dominant model of the marketplace, which is always trying to produce conditions of equivalence across domains of uh, incommensurability, if you will. Um, so to me, learning to work together, uh, the presentation from this morning, Sensing the Shipyard, I thought was another fantastic example of students and teachers uh, working on a site um, and then trying to, you know, how do you actually collate that research? How do you actually, when you're trying to do stuff that deals with, uh, in their case, they were working in a site that the scale of which was quite um, uh, disproportionate, a shipyard in relationship to the scale of this sort of human. And also they were using different kinds of microphones and, et cetera, and sensors and really trying to tap into other sort of registers of, of perception. Um, at, but then they also had the challenge of trying to, in some way, transform that material that they gathered into something that had a certain public kind of legibility as well. So that's also, I think, part of the task of learning to work together is also how we then develop formats that can translate those experiences and hopefully, as a consequence, also start to perhaps to connect with other um, groups of inter other uh, other constituencies or produce other constituencies constituencies of interest um, I mentioned very briefly the the this this sensing project because I thought that was a very I think very kind of powerful um, thread that went through many projects which was um, trying the the condition of the inaudible and the imperceptible and how does one render that into some sort of contingent visibility? And we saw that certainly uh, in the kind of fantastic presentation by Christina Kubich this morning, who's, work, who, who's working with the electromagnetic spectrum and, and all her electromagnetic kind of or walks that she was doing and a kind of long career of trying to tease out the sort of ambient electronic um, Noise, if you will, in our, our in our that you know saturates and permeates our everyday life, and to some c create the conditions where we actually have some sort of awareness of these other sort of atmospheric um, conditions that are very are powerfully operative. And I, something that if I had ha asked her a question, I thought it, it, one thing that came to mind was, uh, and for those of you who are there that, um, for her presentation, this tapping into the electromagnetic spectrum in places like the UK has also been a mode of policing. So the London Met, so the London Metropolitan Police have a, have logged an entire archive of the sound signature of the mains hum, so the, the electromagnetic spectrum of the electrical infrastructure in the city of London. So if you call, if you make an emergency call and you call 999, one of the ways in which you can be located, geolocated, is through the acoustic signature of the environment in which you're standing and making the call. Now that can be beneficial, but we can also understand the ways in which that acoustic signature that is imperceptible to you and I can also be used in other more kind of co coercive kind of ways. So tapping into the, the realm of the imperceptible is also, you know, 
can be weaponized, of course, and, and there would be many kind of examples of that. But so thinking about the inaudible and the in, imperceptible, I was also thinking, of course, about um, uh, Signa Leiden's work, uh, the work of um, Daniel Mann and Sasha Litvin, Litvinseva, whose uh, film on sinkholes and this sort of uh, the traces of, geolog of, of Palestinian presence in some way were uh, folded in or entangled with the kind of mineral history of uh, the area around the kind of Dead Sea. So the ways in which they were using a kind of uh, using a uh, cinematic kind of language and also an acoustic kind of language in the sound design of the film to somehow allow, open up a channel into this history that wasn't necessarily uh, you know, explicit anymore in the landscape. Certain, there, there were sort of no presence of the Palestinian body and very little kind of uh, uh, trace of that, that sort of historic occupation or uh, inhabitation of that land. And yet through the use of certain kinds of um, cinematic language and acoustic kind of language and, and the sort of, I guess the, um, perhaps the, the trying to sort of work with matter and matter as kind of expressive uh, or has that matter has the capacity to somehow register to these traces. I also thought that that was working in that project there. There was others that I, um, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing everybody's name correctly. So Birgit Batchelor, who was, I thought that was a, a great project, which was to, um, a project around the uh, sort of forgotten streams that were, I can't remember if it was, was it the city of Wellington or um, on the North Island of, of New Zealand, the ways in which processes of um, colonization, but also processes of urbanization had transformed the landscape, but it also covered over uh, traces of indigenous presence. So in this case, the, the environmental systems and, I come from Canada, and that's very much the same operation. So maps no longer carry indigenous names, streams have disappeared, et cetera, et cetera. And there have been a, quite a lot of art projects that have tried to um, try to produce the conditions whereby we can have some awareness of that that extremely kind of violent process. And one, I, I saw a project once where manhole covers our sewer covers were glass, and that was the kind of only portal into this sort of indigenous past was through this, like, it's a kind of, that's a pretty, I think, visceral sort of um, device to understand that there's actually, in, in that sort of um, infrastructure, that subterranean infrastructure, there is a kind of history of colonial kind of violence. So I, I also thought that that was, um, really a kind of important um, project. Other, um, other things that um, came to mind, I just talked about learning to work together, was also the role of field, field work. And Charmaine Chua that started the day yesterday, she spent 40 days on a cargo container ship. I can't remember where she went anymore, but it's like, some, over the course of the two days, we did see these moments where there was like an engagement with field work, and it was through that sort of lived experience of spending time somewhere else, um, also going to Shenzhen, a group of students went there with Continuum. All of these kinds of uh, practices of field work became the means by which sort of they were generative of insights, and one really had the sense that the knowledge that came out of that was a consequence of that experience. It wasn't, the, it, wasn't, it wasn't always set up in advance by a set of kind of, um, of, of sort of uh, prevailing understandings, which are often, can often be very kind of reductive and stereotypical, et cetera. One had the sense that in, in the, in the, be, in, the wor in working somewhere else, a different set of understandings started to kind of emerge. Um, of course, Thinking back through many Sonic X uh, festivals now, the geo when I think back to the geological imagination, there's still clearly a strong interest in the environmental and the ecological conditions and the crisis that we find ourselves at. And so um, there was various presentations that were interested in creating or creating multiple perspectives. Um, 
trying to open up channels into the non-human and the more than human. So I see that as an ongoing tendency across uh, now across several kind of sonic acts sort of events and it it comes and goes in different ways um, but I thought this time around the interest in the environmental and the ecological it was present but we had much more of a sense of landscapes as these kind of uh, devices by which we could read kind of political history so it wasn't a so much uh, work that was trying to confront the Anthropocene and global warming per se, but it was looking at how environmental transformations became, um, in some way could offer as a palimpsest in which like densely encrypted sort of histories were contained and efforts through the projects to somehow tap into that. Um, I also appreciated the, the projects that were really trying to look at the role of fiction. So this morning, we had a fantastic uh, session with Jennifer Walsh and all of the work that she was doing around the, trying to think about an Irish science fiction tradition. But, um, and I thought, this is really important um, because the role of fiction, the role of, um, um, and this came up again also in the, dis in the interview with Mother Moore because it's not so much fiction as simply that which is this sort of fabulation, but it's, it's looking at the ways in which other domains of, um, of practice, like they can be writing, poetry, music, et cetera, et cetera. They actually carry information uh, that can be really kind of significant. And we, and so, for example, I think, uh, I think a useful example to consider is the way that contemporary climate scientists are actually looking at literary works to understand. Um, so they might be looking at tourist uh, narratives from the Victorian era, or they're looking at, or they might be looking at, in the case of the Netherlands, the sort of rich legacy of landscape painting from the 16th century. So they're looking at cultural objects as reservoirs of uh, really significant information that can help, can help them understand sort of the past conditions of, 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 of weather systems, of climactic conditions. So we have, an, we have the, the role of fiction, in this case I'd say is, here's a great example where a, ficti a role of fiction or a work of fiction could actually pre be productive of research retroactively. We can read a literary work and we can actually have some insight into the, say, temperature of the earth uh, a few hundred years ago. So uh, I think that's another really important, I think, um, um, it's really important to think about cultural works as harboring different kinds of information uh, and that and not necessarily knowing the specific relevance of that project in its time its relevance may shift quite dramatically and in fact its relevance might be more urgent in times to come than in the very kind of moment in which it's actually um, made another couple of observations would be uh, there is at least uh, no there's three three uh, presentations that dealt with the law and legal instruments and the ways in which legal instruments had were the very means by which a certain violence was um, enacted. So in the film and performance uh, work that we uh, saw today by Nicole Hewitt in relationship to the um, her work in Vukovar and in the working with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, Rana Ham, Hamaday, who was talking about the case of the Zong and the origins of um, um, it, it's Lloyd's Bank, uh, and they merge out of the and they're in the the whole world of insurance emerges out, out of this kind of very infamous um, history of the slaves being thrown kind of overboard. Um, and, but her interest in uh, the questions of justice and, um, and as, as I said, the students, that our, our MA students who are wor actually working with a set of international, um, uh, international human rights lawyers. Um, so I think these projects that are really looking at the ways in which legal instruments are no who we might have tasked with the, with the job of actually delivering some sort of justice, that legal instruments and, um, and even like, insurance uh, 
legal instruments that encode themselves in things like insurance policies actually are the very means by which a certain violence is actually perpetrated. So rather than the means by which we might achieve some sort of justice, they're, 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 the, they're the instruments that actually are producing the kind of injustice. And certainly, Myself, I've done a lot of work for many years in the ICTY, and the, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, the law is not the place where we secure justice. On the contrary, the law is incapable. It can pass judgment, it can pass fines, but it cannot produce the justice that uh, communities need and desire. Um, and I think the um, maybe the other sort of um, element that appeared time over several over many sort of different presentations was infrastructure and uh, and in the case of Solvik Seuss and I think Solvik's still here and Solvik is a former MA student and uh, it's great to see her project AAA Cargo and, and hear her talk about it again and and so we see the kind of uh, an infrastructure that is in the making in, uh, with the new Silk Road in China as it's moving in, and, and going to create its kind of um, economic corridors into um, Eastern Europe and then into sort of Central Europe. So we have this infrastructure on the horizon that is in some way, in Solveig's work, it's, always, it's also in some sort of almost like a mortal battle with like the sand and the erosion that is constantly troubling this sort of smooth flow of kind of capital. But we also see that infrastructure in, uh, in the film Solarium where we see much more of a kind of, um, a you see a certain kind of failing kind of infrastructure. Um, Charmaine Shua talked about sort of monstrous kind of logistics. And so um, I, it's, I think, and, and Nora, uh, Nora Sternfeld in her um, keynote lecture was also talking about infrastructure. And that was one of the words that they were trying to unpack at the kind of Bergen assembly. So it really, I think, Logistics and infrastructure, and the you know, and and people have talked about how we might queer the logistical chain, and I, I so it seems that right now that would be the kind. It, it's strange, like these certain moments that kind of galvanize, um, they galvanize a set of people around them, and they're not you know artists or one of the sort of might be one of the sort of stakeholders, but um, so logistics and infrastructure seems to be one of those um, areas of research interest, but um, how am I doing for time? Okay, and maybe the, the, I'll just wrap up by saying two sort of final things, but I feel like the work that is being, um, the work that is trying to actually somehow grapple with this, whether we're talking about like cloud computing, so like all kinds of computational infrastructures or extractivist practices that are dealing with sort of very, is much more kind of like uh, with mining practices or setting kind of up IT, uh, IT infrastructures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the p work that we did in the port of Rotterdam the other day, um, it throws up a kind of incredible representational challenge because these are not ac infrastructures that one A can, Actually, you can't capture them in an image or in a single kind of sort of soundscape, but nor can you, they're actually difficult to access. So there's a kind of asymmetry of scale that's so profoundly kind of, I think is just incredibly kind of challenging. And, and I really have no sense of how we're actually going to manage that um, asymmetry of scale and also manage other asymmetries, asymmetries of information. And I think the film, Nicole's film on the ICTY, really also touches on that, the personal experience that you have vis-a-vis um, -vis war crimes and yet the kind of the asymmetry of information that is the kind of legacy of a kind of bureaucratic tribunal system. Um, so that's, so infrastructure insofar as it raises kind of acute representational challenges, I think would be something I might want to end on. and. Maybe the final thing I will say um, in wrapping up, and I was thinking about this actually with some of those presentations around um, experimental, um, you know, augmented reality, the production of like highly experimental kind of digital um, image and soundscapes, et cetera, et cetera, was 
and I, and I how would I, how to phrase this? I was thinking about the production of these worlds, and this is also, of course, something that we do in fiction writing, or in you know the making of a, a film or video, etc. Cetera, it's cetera. the production of these novel um, and alternate, maybe they're alternate worlds or in Afrofuturism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the, but the production of these worlds, I think that's really kind of crucial. But I think we have to hang on to, if we're going to think about world making, I also ha think that at every moment we have to think about what is the world that exists when, um, you know, you know, what is the a world um, that exists when uh, a child washes up on the shore from a refugee crisis. We also have to look at the ways in which that incident and that event exists in a particular kind of world. So even though we might be fabulating, creating, imagining, producing different sort of conceptual uh, cosmologies, et cetera, we also, I think, really have to think about what are, what, in what kind of world could certain kinds of events take place? And, and maybe that's just, I think that's the final comment I so would like to end on. So world making, but also understanding very particularly the conditions that allow certain kinds of events to take place, they take place in real spaces, in worlds that we've produced. And I think we also have to understand what kind of world could certain kinds of activities actually take place in and not just produce other worlds. Um, so maybe I just leave it at that. So those are my sort of reflections on, on the past two days. So thank you very much.